Good morning. Bill talked about the evolution of our world and the need for adapting to remain relevant. I'd like to add another dimension to that conversation because not all change occurs slowly. Some change is sudden. Just look at the events of 2016 at home and abroad that raised the ante across our political landscape. Both Britain and the US dealt with surprising results. The British referendum, most commonly known as Brexit, rattled the EU. And perhaps most shocking, right here in the US, the Cubs won the World Series. Now, I'm obviously referring to our poll-defying presidential election. Each of these changes continue to bring uncertainty to the work comp industry. How will Brexit impact the global insurance industry? What will be the future of the Affordable Care Act? How will the election affect the direction of the Department of Labor? And what issues will emerge now that the Federal Open Market Committee has begun raising interest rates? At NCCI, part of our role is to provide insight when there is uncertainty. We take that responsibility seriously, and we do our best to anticipate and explain how changes will impact your business. We do this by leveraging the most comprehensive set, set of work comp data in the world to help foster a healthy system. Some might find that a few of the 2016 work comp results were also unexpected. Net written premium growth was stagnant, and rate and loss cost decreases became the norm across the nation. The combined ratio re remained at an unprecedented level, and, and reserve deficiencies evaporated. We'll cover it all in detail over the next hour, so let's get started. So we're gonna start with the property and casualty results. That'll give us a nice backdrop when we get into the workers' compensation. Let's start with the bottom, the blue bar. Property and casualty net written premium for private carriers, this is just private carriers, increased by 2.6% to $530 billion in 2016. That's lower than last year's growth rate, and in fact, growth rates have been decreasing for the last three years. Up at the top, the standout was personal auto, with a significant increase of about 7.5%. Prices paid for auto insurance have been increasing at a faster rate than the overall CPI. There continues to be an uptick in the number of drivers on the road, and that's driving premium higher in both personal and commercial auto. Now, homeowners and Fire and Ally, they had a moderate increase, as did workers' compensation. It was up about 1% to $40.1 billion in 2016, and it was almost entirely due to payroll growth. Other liability and commercial multi-payroll were the only major lines that saw net written premium decrease in 2016. So it was a mixed bag. Some lines increased and others decreased, but for the most part, underwriting results deteriorated. And that caused the PNC combined ratio to rise by three points to 101 in 2016. Now, other liability and commercial multi payroll, the two lines that you saw on the last slide had decreases in net written premium, they had the largest deterioration in underwriting results, with combined ratio increases of eight and seven points, respectively. What's interesting here is that all lines of business, all major lines of business, except workers' compensation, had worse combined ratios in 2016. Even personal auto, despite the large increase in net written premium that we saw on the prior slide. Distracted driving and the high cost of repairing modern safety technology that's now commonplace in almost all vehicles is increasing both frequency and severity in that line of business. Now we'll dig into the components of the 94 combined ratio for workers' compensation in a minute. First, let's look at the 101 and how it fares relative to the long-term history. 
Now here you can see it's clear that the underwriting cycle is alive and well with upticks in the last three years. The purple lines are the average combined ratios over the most recent two underwriting cycles, two full underwriting cycles. And this most recent underwriting cycle was two years shorter and four points milder than the last. Now this has certainly been influenced by the Great Recession. And the continued mild combined ratios are due in part to the ongoing historically low interest rate environment. This year's 101 is right in line with the average combined ratio from the most recent underwriting cycle and it's really a pretty good result. Now if we look at investment results, here we've highlighted the same two underwriting cycles that we had on the last slide and the average investment gain ratio is also four points lower. The investment gain ratio that we're showing you here is made up of two components net investment income and realized capital gains. Both are shown as a ratio to earn premium and both decreased in 2016. For, this is actually the third year in a row also for the investment gain ratio that we've seen it decrease. Now we thought it'd be interesting to look at this and determine whether or not inflation has had an, had an impact on the real investment gain ratio. And we found that you see a very similar pattern to what you see here. So the bottom line is, whether you look at it on a real or a nominal basis, this investment environment is different. The bond portfolio yield has been declining for decades. As bonds are maturing, they're being reinvested at this historically low yields, and that's contributing to the decrease in investment gains that you see here. So a year with mild underwriting losses and a declining investment gain led to a moderate but declining return on surplus. The PNC after tax return on surplus dropped to about 6% in 2016. That's down from last year's 8.5% and below the long-term average. The major driver this year was a shift from an underwriting gain in 2015 to an underwriting loss in 2016 and two carriers had a very large impact, and together they lowered the ratio by almost two points. So while the impact on after-tax return on surplus that you see here is a noticeable decline, surplus levels themselves remain robust. At the top, we have the premium to surplus ratio, and it's been stable since the Great Recession, but it did drop a point to 75 in 2016. We have the components of the ratio at the bottom. You saw earlier that net written premium increased, but surplus increased more, and that drove the ratio down. In fact, since 2010, we've seen net written premium increase about $100 billion, but surplus has increased by about $150 billion. So to recap this section, net written premium and the combined ratios are both up. The investment gain ratio decreased, but surplus increased. Now let's move on to workers' compensation. And we'll start with premium. So here's the $40.1 billion of private carrier net written premium, and you can see how it compares to the long-term history. If you look back at 2005, um, that was the pre-recession peak for the countrywide number. Private carriers that year wrote $37.8 billion of net written premium. If you follow the bars along, you can see that net written premium declined during the Great Recession, and then it grew throughout the recovery. Now if we add in state funds, countrywide net written premium is $45.5 billion. That's no change. And in total, we've yet to exceed our pre-recession peak. So what's going on here? Well, there are a couple of things. First, in statutory accounting, offshore sessions serve to reduce net written premium. And we're using statutory accounting here. And this is the second year that we've seen material increases in offshore sessions. Now, in addition to that, seeded premium as a percentage of total premium has been increasing over the last five years. 
Now the underlying data that we're using on this slide is a bit different from the prior slide. This is earned and that was written and this includes assumed, but the major takeaway remains relevant. The first pie shows you direct and assumed premium back in 2011. And you can see that the pie got larger, premium increased, and the next pie is 2016. But the percentage seeded also increased from 24% to 31% over this period. Another way to look at it is on the bottom. The average annual growth rate in direct and assumed was 7% over this period. But seeded has increased by 13% over the same period. Now there are obviously a significant number of offsetting changes that can impact net written premium. But given the slowdown in growth, we thought this one was important and we should point it out, the impact on net written premium due to more sessions. Certain risks can't find coverage in the voluntary market and then they end up in the residual market. Premium for NCCI service residual market pools has been stable for the last four policy years. And our estimate of the ultimate premium is $1.1 billion for both policy years 2015 and 2016. Now, even though the latest two policy years look equal, we are estimating about a 5% drop in 2016. But there's really nothing concerning here, nothing alarming in the pools. Now, on this side, we've added in direct assignment premium. And this has been updated through the first quarter of 2017, and we've broken out the premium by size of risk. Legend has it that large risks are a leading indicator of the future size of the residual market. So in other words, when large risks find coverage elsewhere, in the coming years, the size of the residual market gets smaller. You can see that premium volume has been declining for all risk sizes greater than $10,000. Those are the ones highlighted in purple. In fact, residual market premium for policies greater than 100,000 was down 29% year over year. So while in total we're not seeing a significant depopulation yet in the residual market, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on this in the quarters to come. Here's the residual market share, and it's indicating that 8% of premium can't find coverage in the voluntary market. This is once again no change from last year. It's obviously good news and a sign that the industry is performing well. Like most numbers in the presentation, the residual market share varies fairly significantly from state to state. And the current shares range anywhere from about 1% in the lowest state to over 20%. All right, so let's shift back to our analysis of the entire market. Now this is looking at countrywide direct written premium before we were looking at net written premium. Direct written premium increased by 2.4% in 2016. And you can see, like I said, there's considerable variation across states. Now Utah is dark green, and that represents a significant increase, but it really should have an asterisk beside it, because Utah converted from being a state fund in 2015 to being a private carrier in 2016. So it wasn't in our numbers last year, and that's just making Utah look like they had more premium growth than they really did. New York is another state that's had higher than average premium growth. That's partly due to the increase in loss costs that they've seen there, and also because risks are moving out of the state fund and into the private carrier market. On the other hand, look at West Virginia. It's been falling since back in 2005 when they converted from being a monopolistic state fund. Now looking at a geographical map like this, sometimes the colors can be misleading. States with a large geographical area may not be heavily populated, and as a result, they might have a very small impact on the countrywide average. To create a better perspective, we can change the size of the state so that it no longer represents the geographical area. And instead, it now represents the volume of premium in that state. 
So for example, California is now larger than Texas because California has more than $11 billion of private carrier direct written premium, and Texas has less than $2 billion. Now if we overlay the color gradient, it's easier to see that there's more green, and that's leading to a countrywide increase of about 2.4%. It's also easier to see which states are the major drivers. We already talked about New York and the increase there, but California also grew at a faster pace than the countrywide average. Declining rates in California have been more than offset by payroll growth, as the economy out there has been pretty healthy with higher than average wage inflation. Now, a few jurisdictions are bright red, like West Virginia and DC, but their size is so small that they're not having a large impact on the countrywide average. Now, while countrywide direct written premium increased, at the top you can see direct written premium for NCCI states remained flat, no change. And that makes sense when you think back to the last slide, the states that I pointed out as having higher than average premium growth were not NCCI states. Now we have the, the detail underlying our states, so we can identify the components that's driving the premium change, and that's what we've done here. The largest driver was once again payroll growth, with an increase of about 4%. Change in loss cost and mix suppressed direct written premium growth by about 2.7%. Carriers provided deeper discounts in 2016, and that slowed premium growth. I mentioned that the Utah State Fund became a private carrier, and that boosted premium growth by about 1%. And then if you include miscellaneous other factors, that gets us to no change in direct written premium. Now let's look at these one by one over the next few slides. Since payroll is the largest driver, we can use Moody's forecasts to break it down even further. Now the 4.5% that you see here doesn't match the 4% on the prior slide because it's from a different source, but the detail helps us explain the underlying components. So the 4.5% payroll growth is approximately equal to a 2.5% increase in average wages and a 1.9% increase in employment. So basically, more people were working and at higher wages. At the bottom, we have the economic sectors listed by size of payroll. And you can see that average wages for education and health services, contracting, leisure and hospitality, and all other grew at an above average rate. Employment grew at an above average rate for professional and business services, education and health services, contracting, and leisure and hospitality. Now the outliers were manufacturing, once again, it was essentially flat, and all other. All other decreased due to a decline in employment in natural resources and mining. Now on average, the approved changes in the Bureau premium level effective in 2016 were negative 2.5%. Now it's worth mentioning that the Florida increase of plus 14.5 effective back last December is reflected in that number. But filings effective in 2017 were significantly more negative, and they currently average to a decrease of about 6.7%. That's the largest average decrease in recent history. That's because the most recent filings were decreases in all states except two, Hawaii and South Carolina. Now this is different from the last slide because here we're capturing the most recent voluntary filing activity and law onlys are excluded here. So the Florida plus 14.5 is not here and instead we've captured the January 2016 decrease in Florida of 4.7%. There are no pending filings at this time. And we've got the filings ranked from the largest decrease, which was in West Virginia, 14.7, to the small increase in South Carolina. 
Now we'll dig into the drivers of these big decreases when we get to the loss section, but they include decreases in frequency, declines in medical and indemnity severity, and improved experience in the most recent policy years that are rolling into our filings. Now while sometimes it's useful to do what we did on that last slide and compare changes in loss costs across states or even average rates between states, sometimes the results can be misinterpreted. We've created this first video to emphasize what needs to be considered when you're comparing results across states. Everyone knows that it's not appropriate to compare apples and oranges, yet it's easy to fall into that trap. Take lost costs, for example. Generally speaking, benefits, or losses, are paid to injured workers in two ways, indemnity for lost wages while the injured worker is recovering, and medical for treatment. When losses are then compared to payroll, this is called a loss cost. These are determined for each job classification and can vary significantly across occupations. To get a sense of the loss cost level across all job types for a state, we can take an average, but not just any average will do. A simple average would give equal weight to each job type. However, there are far more computer programmers than lumberjacks. To calculate the average, we need to weight the loss costs for each job type. That way, the average state loss cost truly represents the mix of businesses in that state. Now that we have an average loss cost for each state, can we just line them up next to each other and compare them? No way! That would be a case of apples and oranges. Savannah and Pierre are here to illustrate. Savannah is from Georgia and Pierre is from South Dakota. And it's clearly not reasonable to compare the two. So why would it be okay to compare loss costs in Georgia to those in South Dakota? Sorry darling, that just ain't right. Remember, to reflect each state's mix of business, we use each state's own payroll by job type. That mix of business can vary from state to state. Some states have more office and clerical jobs, and others have more in energy or construction. Differences in the mix of job types can have a big impact on average loss costs and make comparisons across states tricky. What else can cause average loss costs to vary across states? Well, on the indemnity side, benefits for injured workers may vary across states due to differing wage levels, benefit rates, durations, cost of living adjustments, waiting periods, retroactive periods, and maximum weekly benefits. These factors can also change over time as new laws are enacted and the courts interpret those laws. Speaking of courts, let's talk about litigation. Regardless of whether a state's workers' comp system is court-based, or administrative, attorney involvement percentages may notably vary across states. A simple comparison of average loss costs across states hides the underlying details. States with the same average loss cost might have completely different systems. The first might have an above average level of benefits and little attorney involvement. The second might be more litigious and provide an average level of benefits. On the medical side, costs may vary across states based on the existence of medical fee schedules, treatment guidelines, network penetration, and trends in healthcare costs. Each state runs its own show with different statutes and degrees of regulatory oversight that can also have a material impact on average loss costs. State-specific loss costs reflect a complex interaction of many different forces. Two states with similar average loss costs may differ in many ways, just like apples and oranges. It's important to remember that the relative magnitude of a state's average loss cost does not indicate the adequacy of the loss costs themselves, nor does it tell us anything about the health of a state's workers' compensation system. So for purposes of this presentation, we define discounting as policyholder dividends, schedule rating, credits, or debits, and rate or loss cost departures from NCCI's benchmark level. Over the last year, we've refined our benchmark level. Now it excludes expense constants and profit and contingencies provisions. When we did that, the prior years shifted a bit, but the general trends remain the same. 
Now recall that more carrier discounting decreased direct written premium. You can see that discounting moved from a plus 2.6% in policy year 15 to about a half a percent in policy year 16. Today's discounting is very modest relative to what we were seeing back in the late 90s. Back then, carriers were utilizing all three methods to provide deep premium discounts. When you look at the bars prior to 02, they were all below the white line. In contrast, in recent years, discounting is a mix of small dividends, moderate schedule rating credits, and upward rate and loss cost departures. So basically since 2002, the individual elements have been offsetting. And to wrap up this section, we have the latest results from the CIAB survey. Now here we're comparing the fourth quarter results from 2013 all the way through to 2016. The green portion of the bar represents the percentage of respondents that reported seeing an increase in their workers' compensation premium at renewal. The red are those that saw a decrease. Now back in 2013, almost 75% of respondents said they were seeing an increase in their premium at renewal. But by 2016, 62% were saying they're seeing a decrease. Now if you look at the fourth quarter of both 2015 and 2016, they're very similar. And this is typically what we see at the turn of a cycle. So it'll be interesting to track this in the months to come and see if that actually comes to fruition. All right, let's talk results. Here's the 94 combined ratio, and you can see how it fares relative to the long-term history. Now, we haven't seen consecutive combined ratios at this level at least since 1975, and that was as far as I could go back when NCCI was tracking private carrier combined ratios. The 94 this year is even more remarkable because a single carrier contributed four points due to material adjustments and prior period losses in premium. So excluding that carrier, the combined ratio would have been 90, and that would have been the lowest in at least 40 years. Now the purple line shows that the same phenomenon holds true for workers' compensation as did for the property and casualty industry as a whole. This most recent underwriting cycle is shorter and milder than the last. Here we have the combined ratio components and they're very similar to last year's. If you look at the bottom, the preliminary loss ratio is clearly what's driving the low combined ratio. It came in at a record 53%. You have to look back to the mid-90s to find ratios anywhere near the levels that we're seeing now. Now on this slide, we're looking at LAE as a percentage of earned premium. On the next slide, we'll look at it relative to incurred losses. But here, it's stable at about 14%. Underwriting expenses are also stable, and dividends added about a point to the countrywide combined ratio. Now, relative to incurred losses, when we look at LAE, you see a little bit of a different pattern. Since LAE is the cost of adjusting losses, this has always felt like a more appropriate measure to me. The ratio's generally been increasing since it's low of about 18% back in 2001. Now to understand why, we have to break down the ratios. Over this time period, the cost of adjusting claims, which is in the numerator, has increased eight times faster than losses. The amount spent on DCC, defense and cost containment, has almost tripled since 2001. Now that's not that surprising because it's widely known that the industry's put a lot of energy into medical cost containment over the last decade. The recent surge is also being driven by California because the WCIRB has reported seeing a sharp increase in DCC in their state. 
Here's the combined ratio for the NCCI service pools. Our most recent estimate for the ultimate combined ratios for 2015 and 2016 are 103 and 106, respectively. So all in all, a very good result. Residual market depopulation and pricing programs are in place in all NCCI states, and now other states are also considering their implementation to reduce the size of their assigned risk market. Investment gains by line of business are separated in the IEE into those that are attributable to insurance transactions and those that are from investing capital and surplus. Now, when I showed you the PNC section, the investment gains there, we included both. But here we're just looking at the gains attributable to workers' compensation insurance transactions. NCCI's preliminary estimate of the IGIT is 12%. That's up from last year's 10.9% and below the long-term average for the third year in a row. Now, while the long-term investment environment can certainly influence the underwriting environment, with low investment yields le leading to a focus on underwriting discipline, we don't see a clear pattern in the investment gain ratios year over year like we do in the combined ratios. Since investment gains can fluctuate quite a bit from year to year, it's really important to take a long-term view when you analyze these values. That's also true for the operating gain. A 12-point investment gain and a six-point underwriting gain led to an 18-point operating gain. Now, Bill shared this slide with you earlier. 2015 and 2016 are well above average, but you only have to look back to 09, 10, and 11 to be reminded that the industry has struggled in recent years. Now the average that you see here is heavily influenced by the number of years that we show. If the period was five years shorter, the average would have been two points lower. Credible and objective organizations make every attempt to be consistent throughout the slides and not adjust the number of years in their slides to fit the agenda. As NCCI moves towards its thought leadership initiative, we want to continue to be recognized as the source you trust for insight into important topics. And one of those is social security disability income. Bill mentioned that we're researching this topic because it's gotten a lot of attention in, rec in recent years how changes in workers' compensation compensability standards and benefit levels can impact SSDI. Now, some have claimed that in a race to the bottom, states have lowered benefit levels, and injured workers that should be turning to workers' compensation are instead looking to SSDI for wage replacement. This next video is a primer to explain the basics of how these complex benefit programs interact. Meet Tom and Jerry, delivery drivers in the same state. They're both in good health, although Tom has a minor heart condition. One unfortunate day, they both suffered injuries and separate incidents. Tom was making a delivery, which was clearly one of his work-related duties. Jerry, however, was on his lunch break. As it turns out, the circumstances surrounding each of their injuries could determine whether the cost of their medical treatment and reimbursement for lost wages are covered by workers' compensation insurance. You see, a law was recently changed in their state, making it more difficult to qualify for workers' comp benefits. For a claim to be compensable, work must now be the major cause of the injury. Previously, only a causal connection to work was required. Some say employees with injuries that are no longer covered under workers' comp might try to file for Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI, benefits. As a result, there may be a potential for cost shifting between workers' comp and SSDI. But wait, aren't these totally different ballgames? Yes and no. Workers' comp is intended to compensate injured employees if the injury is work-related. SSDI provides benefits for workers who become totally disabled from an injury or condition. 
whether work-related or not. As you can see, there is some overlap between the two, so a shift in costs from one program to another could occur. Now let's get back to Tom and Jerry. In Jerry's case, he was deemed eligible to receive workers' compensation benefits, even though he was on his lunch break. How about Tom? Unfortunately, the combination of Tom's pre-existing heart condition and his recent work-related injury left him totally disabled. In this case, Tom may qualify as a dual recipient, making him eligible to receive both workers' compensation and SSDI benefits, subject to a cap. No, oh, not a baseball cap, a cap on his total benefits. In most states, the full workers' comp benefit is paid and the SSDI benefit is lowered so that the combined benefit does not exceed the cap. The very existence of a workers' comp claim means that SSDI will pay out less than it otherwise would. Now what if workers' compensation statutes change in a way that affects benefits? In most states, when the combined benefit cap applies, an increase in workers' comp benefits could decrease the SSDI portion, while a decrease in workers' comp benefits could increase the SSDI portion. In about 15 states, often referred to as reverse offset states, the workers' comp benefits are offset for certain types of injuries. There are a lot of moving parts. So who decides if and how workers' compensation laws should change? That would be our friends in the state legislature. They have the challenging task of setting compensability standards and determining the scope of benefits in a way that is fair and balanced for all stakeholders. No pressure, right? Some might think the legislature should just raise benefits paid to injured workers, but doing so results in higher claims costs, which ultimately requires higher premiums. Nevertheless, in the last 15 years, more states have enacted benefit level increases than decreases. Speaking of benefits paid to injured workers, we recently followed up with Tom and Jerry and were thrilled to find that they both have fully recovered from their injuries. Hooray for that! As you can see, there are many moving pieces. It's to everyone's benefit to fully understand how they interact. Doing so will ultimately help to make sure that those who are disabled get the care they need. So as you heard in the video, changes to benefit levels and compensability standards can impact the interaction of benefits provided by both workers' compensation and SSDI. Now, one of the first questions that needs to be answered is whether or not states have indeed reduced benefit levels in a race to the bottom. Since permanent partial is the most likely benefit type that would be paired with a non-work-related injury or condition and result in permanent and total disability, we thought we'd start there. Now, we've gone all the way back to 2000 and accumulated the PPD indemnity benefit changes as originally priced. They're seen in our annual statistical bulletin. We're showing you every state here through 2015. Now we've removed the impact of wage inflation. In other words, while benefits did increase across all states during this period due to increases in wages, or statutory weekly maximums, this only includes the changes above and beyond that. Now what's most important to note here is that only eight states have decreased PPD indemnity benefits since 2000. Every other state has increased benefits, either at the same rate as wage inflation, those are the ones with, that don't show up at all, it's just a flat line, or faster, those are the ones at the right. So how does this impact SSDI? Well, as you saw in the video, when changes occur to work comp benefits and someone is a dual recipient, the total benefits are subject to a cap. The majority of states have what's called a standard offset, and work comp benefits serve to reduce SSDI benefits in the standard offset states. That happens when the combination of the two exceed the cap. Now the first bar shows you what happens in year one. That's the sum of the two benefits before the offset. 
The second bar is actually what happens. Due to the cap, SSDI benefits are reduced and workers' compensation benefits remain the same. Now we're sharing this today because sometimes the headlines don't tell the full story. Could a change in workers' compensation benefits lead to a shift in SSDI? Yes, but the opposite is also true, and the mere existence of workers' compensation often serves to lower SSDI benefits. Now, up to this point, we focused on calendar year and policy year results. But accident years can also be enlightening because they speak to the current year underwriting results without the distortions from the prior year reserve changes that can occur. Now let me take a second to lay out this slide. Um, the green bars that you're looking at here, you've actually seen before. Those are the calendar year combined ratios. And there's the 94 in both 2015 and 2016. The blue bars are the accident year combined ratios, as reported in Schedule P of the NAIC annual statement. Now looking at the most recent years, the 2015 and 2016 accident year combined ratios are higher than the calendar year combined ratios. In a perfect world, the calendar year results would equal the accident year results, but in reality, that's not what happens. Carriers tend to adjust their accident year reserve levels over time as the underwriting cycle ebbs and flows and claims mature, and that causes the two to be different. Now on this slide, we've carried over the as-reported accident year combined ratios, but here we're comparing them to NCCI's estimate of the ultimate accident year combined ratios. Those are in light blue. Each year, NCCI conducts its own private carrier reserve analysis to determine the strength of the reserves held in each accident year and also to quantify the overall deficiency for the industry. Let's walk through the steps of that analysis over the next couple of slides. Now to calculate the combined ratios, all we do is simply add the underwriting expense and dividend ratios from the results section that I showed you earlier to our estimate of the ultimate loss and LAE ratios. Now those are shown here. NCCI's selections for the accident year loss and LAE ratios are the starting point for determining the overall reserve deficiency. The pattern of deficiency and redundancy follows the underwriting cycle. Looking at the light purple bars, you'll notice that the NCCI selections for accident years 07 through 11 are higher than the industry booked. The opposite is true for 12 through 16. In fact, we expect the booked loss and LAE ratio of 72 for 2016 to develop downward to 65 over time. In other words, we expect accident years 07 to 11 to be deficient and 12 through 16 to be redundant. Now if we take those across all years and add them up and add in the deficiency from the prior period, even though we expect the most recent years to develop favorably, the overall reserve position is still deficient. To convert the ratios to dollars, we simply multiply by each year's premium and add them all up. And for 2016, that results in a reserve deficiency of $5 billion. That's $2 billion less from last year's deficiency. Now our estimate includes the tabular discount. That's the allowed reduction in reserves due to lifetime pension cases. Note that the tabular discount in 2016 is $4.5 billion of the $5 billion reserve deficiency. So net of the discount, that leaves little to no deficiency. Now the current deficiency is about 4% of total reserves. And to put that into perspective, if you go back to 2001, the deficiency represented 33% of total reserves. As I mentioned earlier, the deficiency is cyclical. As the underwriting results deteriorate during the building of a soft market like we had back in the late 90s, carriers accumulate reserve deficiencies to improve their calendar year results. And then the opposite occurs during a hard market, and that allows carriers to eliminate those deficiencies. 
You can see here how 2007 developed downward over the first nine years, and then it was strengthened in 2016. The upward development in 2007 is actually in sync with last year's NCCI reserve analysis that showed that carriers had gone too far in reducing reserves for 2007, accident year 07. This year also brought reserve releases for 2014 and 2015, and that's again in line with NCCI's expectations. So in summary for this section, since private carriers in total are carrying little to no reserve deficiency, that means the calendar year results are pretty much on point. Some accident years need strengthening, others will develop downward over time, but in total the reserves are just about right. Now let's look at the detailed loss drivers. We'll start with frequency. NCCI's preliminary estimate for the change in loss time frequency is a decrease of about 4%. This is very similar to last year. We had what, last year 4.6% and the long-term average is 3.6%, so it's all right in line with each other. The 4.6% that you see for 2015 was revised downward since last year's AIS. We had an initial estimate there of about 3%. As more data becomes available, we do revise both our frequency and severity numbers, and that year seemed a little conservative when we took a look at it again. The industry's only seen two increases in frequency over the last 20 years, and the only significant one was coming out of the Great Recession during the recovery. There's no indication that the countrywide decrease in frequency is slowing down. But frequency across states can see volatility from one year to the next. And to smooth that, we like to look at a five-year average. We've got the average annual change shown here from 2011 to 2015. Now, as you would expect, the vast majority of states have had declines in frequency. Any shade of red represents a decrease, and a dark shade of red represents a significant decline. Oregon is the only state that's had an average annual increase in frequency over these five years, and even that state is very small, it's essentially flat. Reforms and system changes in Texas, Oklahoma, and West Virginia have likely led to frequency changes well below the countrywide average in those states. All right, let's move on to medical. Since medical is about 60% of total benefits, it's important to understand medical cost drivers. Providing regulatory and legislative support is one of NCCI's core objectives, and access to transactional medical data through the medical data call has allowed us to research and provide information on aspects of the system that were quite honestly unavailable to us before we had this data. One example is the medical data report. It's an important initiative that's helped states determine which medical services are driving costs. The reports are now in their fifth year of production, and they're now available to carriers in any state where they write workers' compensation benefits. Now this is the type of information that we have in the medical data reports. For service year 2015, physician costs were about 40% of total medical costs across NCCI states, while prescription drugs were about 11%. We can take that and for each state we can drill down even further. For example, for the same service year, 24% of physician costs were due to surgery and 10% due to radiology. Now details like this are imperative in determining the impact of medical fee schedules. I'll talk more about that in a minute. In recent years, there have been a lot of articles on the cost of brand name and repackaged drugs. The medical data call also allows us to look at that and we can track now the utilization of these drugs over time. Over at the left, you can see that back in 2011, Generic equivalents were 47% of all drug payments. 
and that's increased to 58% by 2015. But interestingly enough, that's not due to medical cost containment. It's good news, however, the shift was largely driven by patents expiring on very popular drugs like Celebrex and Cymbalta and Lidoderm. Over at the right, you can see that repackaged drugs now represent a very small proportion of overall payments. More states are implementing regulation on the reimbursement of repackaged drugs, and that's very good news. Now, in an effort to lower the cost of medical treatment, many jurisdictions either implement or try to improve upon their existing prescription drug fee schedules. NCCI has recently completed research that will help quantify these types of complex changes, and I'm going to share the results of that research with you in a minute. But first, let's watch this last video that explains the many connected stakeholders that play a role in these increasingly important cost containment measures. In an effort to control costs, many states have implemented prescription drug fee schedules for workers' comp. You may be wondering, how do the fee schedules actually work, and who are the different parties involved? I'm glad you asked. To explain, we'll introduce several key players and bring them along with us. Manny, the drug manufacturer, Phil, the friendly pharmacist, Jackson, the injured employee from Mississippi, and Ingrid, representing the insurance company for Jackson's employer. Let's start with Jackson. Jackson's doctor prescribes medication to treat his work-related injury. Jackson visits his pharmacist to pick up his medicine and goes home to rest and recover. The pharmacist then seeks reimbursement for the cost of the prescription drug from the insurance company. Since Mississippi has a prescription drug fee schedule, the reimbursement amount paid to the pharmacist is subject to a limit. These schedules are typically based on the average wholesale price per pill or unit, AWP for short. The drug's manufacturer sets the AWP. Think of this as the manufacturer's suggested retail price. The maximum amount reimbursable to the pharmacist, also known as the MAR, is specified as a multiplier times the AWP, times the quantity of drugs dispensed, plus a dispensing fee. The multipliers and dispensing fees can vary quite a bit across states depending on the characteristics of the drug transactions, such as brand name versus generic drugs, and whether the drugs were pharmacy or physician dispensed. Let's go over that again. In the simplified case, the manufacturer sets the AWP for a drug. The pharmacist purchases the drug from the manufacturer and provides it to Jackson. The pharmacist then gets reimbursed at the MAR from the insurance company. Sometimes an administrator of prescription drug programs called a Pharmacy Benefit Manager, or PBM, is also involved. These folks negotiate agreements and serve as an intermediary between the pharmacist, the manufacturer, and the insurance company. In this arrangement, the insurance company pays the PBM, who in turn reimburses the pharmacist. What are the advantages of having a PBM involved? For one, the insurance company can lower their costs via bulk discounts and rebates that the PBMs arrange with the manufacturer. They also benefit from the bill review services provided by the PBM. The pharmacist benefits from the PBM's establishment of a drug formulary and welcomes the opportunity to reach additional customers through his association with the PBM. Now that you're an expert on prescription drug fee schedules from AWPs to MARS and PBMs, feel free to go forth and use this information to impress your friends at dinner parties and at the next Workers' Compensation Trivia Contest. So on the surface, it's reasonable to assume that the implementation of an AWP-based prescription drug fee schedule, like you saw in the video, would always lower prices paid for medication. But not all prescription drug fee schedules are created equal. In fact, the opposite effect can occur, and it can increase costs. To analyze the impact of prescription drug fee schedules, NCCI classified states into four categories. 
Those with a fee schedule were labeled low, medium, or high based on the size of their AWP multiplier. And everybody else with, without a fee schedule was the fourth category. Now, two of the major takeaways from our study are on the slide. Moving from no fee schedule to a relatively low fee schedule can significantly reduce the prices paid for medication. So that's great news, right? But over at the right, you can see that moving from no fee schedule to a relatively high fee schedule can actually increase costs. Now, one possible explanation is the influence of the pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, that you saw in the video. Through their negotiations in states with no fee schedule, prices, it seems, are already comparable to the AWP, and moving to a high fee schedule actually might make things worse. Now, these are a few takeaways from the paper. The entire econometric model that we used and all the details are on ncci.com. So if you want to look at that, it's already out there. Now, the video talked about prescription drug fee schedules. But in most states, workers' compensation physician services are also subject to a fee schedule, much like group health or Medicare. In fact, work comp physician fee schedules are often based on Medicare values. One way to measure physician costs across states is actually to compare the work comp payments within the state to a benchmark such as Medicare, the Medicare reimbursement rate. As you can see here, prices paid relative to Medicare vary quite considerably from state to state. They're anywhere from about 100% to over 250%. And the average is right at 150%. Now, if you focus on the five highest states over to the right, other than Alaska, they're all operating without physician fee schedules. I'll note that one of those is Virginia, and they're actually looking to implement one, though, in 2018. This is just another example of how fee schedules are an effective way to reduce costs and workers' compensation. And that's important because medical severity was up in 2016. NCCI's preliminary estimate of the average medical cost per lost time claim increased by about 5% to $29,100 in 2016. Now, had we taken a straight path to the 29-1, we would have seen a plus 2 in 15 and a plus 2 in 2016. But instead, we decided to take a detour. NCCI spent a lot of time analyzing that negative 1.4 that you see there. And we verified that it was legitimate and it was present in multiple data types. The medical data call pointed to a decrease in physician utilization as one of the drivers of the drop. And then we looked at the unit data and identified contracting as the industry group that was most impacted. Now, it's possible that 2016 actually looks higher because it's coming off of a low starting point. But we'll continue to monitor this over the, the following year, and we'll be publishing our updates to it. So be on the lookout for that as more data comes in. Now, the purple line follows the bars from the top of the previous slide. And we've indexed everything on this slide back to 1995. The green line is the cumulative change in the PHC over the same period. Now, in years past, we would have shown this same slide, but we would have used the medical CPI as our proxy for medical inflation. In 2016, NCCI did a review, and we looked at other possible proxies for medical inflation that might be more appropriate for comparisons to workers' compensation. And we determined that the Personal Health Care Chain Weighted Price Index, we're just going to call it the PHC, is most appropriate. Now, we recognize a shift to a new index is a big change, so we'll be publishing a paper in the upcoming months, so be on the lookout for that, and we'll have all the numbers underlying the PHC in the State of the Line Guide. Medical severity has increased about 227%, while the PHC has increased by about 66%. 
Now what's interesting to note is that the PHC, just like workers' compensation sever medical severity, was different in 2015, and it presented its lowest increase in years. What's also interesting is that medical severity has increased at a slower rate since the recession. In fact, as you can see here, the periods from 95 to 01, 02 to 08, and 09 to 16 are all very different. Now when we look at the change in medical severity, we like to divide it into two components, the change in price and the change in utilization. So the PHC is now our new proxy for the change in price. And anything over and above that is considered a change in the utilization of medical services. If you start with the purple arrow over on the left, you can see from 95 to 01, medical severity increased by about 72%. Prices increased by 16%, and the remaining 56% was an increase in utilization. From 02 to 08, prices increased at a pretty similar rate, but utilization, as you can see, slowed. And then over at the far right, from 09 to 16, the change in utilization was almost non-existent. Now here's medical severity across the states. This corresponds to the same five years that we showed you on the frequency slide, 2011 to 2015. There's more variety here, some increases, some decreases. Some of the larger increases are in Mississippi and Virginia. In Mississippi, large losses were the big contributor there. And then I mentioned that Virginia is now in the process of coming up with their own medical fee schedule, and that may ultimately put downward pressure on medical costs per claim in the Commonwealth. So what about indemnity? Well, NCCI's estimate for the indemnity cost per lost time claim was an increase of about 3% to $23,900 in 2016. Now, this is right in line with the past few years. It's a fairly moderate increase, and it's very close to the change in average weekly wage over the same period of about 2.5%. If we go to the next slide, you can see how the average change in indemnity cost per lost time claim has risen here relative to the change in average weekly wage over the last 20 years. Since 95, wages have increased by about 100%, while indemnity costs have increased about 145%. But just like medical, the rate of change has slowed since the Great Recession. And again, there are three distinct periods with different slopes. If you start at the left, from 95 to 01, wages increased by about 32%. But indemnity severity increased 33% over and above wage inflation. The period between 02 and 08 is less dramatic, but indemnity severity continued to outpace wage inflation during that period. And then look at the most recent period. It's, it's the opposite. The opposite is occurring. Wages rose by 19%, while indemnity severity rose by only 7%. Now, if we look at the state level, the average change in indemnity severity over the last five years, just like medical, is a bit of a mixed bag. Oklahoma, Kansas, and Tennessee, they all had reforms that lowered indemnity benefits in their states. In Missouri, Senate Bill 1 shifted payments from the second injury fund to private carriers, and that's put upward pressure on indemnity severity in that state. And then if you look at New Mexico, large losses have impacted their indemnity severity. Now all of the numbers underlying all of the maps that you've seen in this section are available now on ncci.com in our Frequency and Severity Results by State. We release that every year sometime in the spring. So be sure to take a look at that. That brings us to the end of the 2017 State of the Line. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the symposium.